Okay, here we go. Time to finish up with uh, prototypes and finish up the course. Uh, again, it's been a long road. I hope uh, you're enjoying it as much as I am. It'll be great to uh, hit the finish line. So let's go. Uh, chapter 14, we have finished uh, the concepts, the uh, prototype declarations, is connect, and then reuse of uh, defined prototypes as uh, external prototypes, external proto declares, which you can then uh, leave the master copies all alone, let them be the one and truly best copy, and then let your external protos in different scenes reuse them. Proto instance um, is how we now go forward and take those external proto declares or proto declares in the same scene and stamp out a cookie cutter copy of that node. So let's go to proto instance. So let's uh, take a look at this guy. So the way it works is you can make these new copies, actual copies of the prototype in the scene after you've defined it. And that definition is either the prototype uh, declaration, the proto declare, or the extern proto declare. Um, and if you don't do that, an error results. And you might ask why? Hmm, why is that? Well, of course, X3D is pretty strict. Uh, uh, so what's, what's needed is the uh, X3D player uh, okay, come on here. The X3D player needs to know uh, the definition so that it can create a copy of the node in, uh, in advance. It, if it doesn't know the definition of it, it can't place it in the scene graph. Since we place such a high premium on performance, then getting that uh, going uh, boom, 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 as we load the scene graph is very important. And this is why you have to have uh, a prior declaration in there. Okay. But once you've done that prior declaration, it's pretty simple actually to uh, uh, make this work. And all you have to do is put a proto instance and give it a name. And then that's it. Uh, so using it in the node, using that node in your scene from then on is very straightforward. Okay, uh, now the next thing we can do, since we've defined all these fields in a prototype, just like a regular X3D node has fields, when we create the node, when we build the proto instance, we can also override its default values and customize the node just the way we want. So this is done using the field value tag. And whenever you do a field value, you are uh, uh, defining the name, defining the value, and this is essentially uh, an initialization. Okay, and so that's what you're doing whenever you create a field value. And uh, uh, what this next part says is if you uh, have a field that is a SF node type or an MF node type, then you can also uh, initialize that. And the way we do that is simply by having uh, uh, child nodes inside the field value. instead of using the simple value for regular floats and integers and booleans and arrays. Okay. So let's take a look at an example. Here we have uh, this scene in the chapter 14 examples called Art Deco Examples Excerpt.X3D. And uh, this guy uh, is different than the uh, prototype 
declare examples. This is the uh, uh, examples expert excerpt shows us how to use extern proto declare. Okay, so in our case, we have uh, three copies of three of the different Art Deco nodes. And what we're interested in is the first one. And so Art Deco 00, zero gets defined right here in the extern proto declare. And notice that uh, uh, it doesn't have any field declarations because this prototype doesn't have any fields to be overridden. Each one is a predefined fixed value material node. So we just want to use that, reuse that material node down in the scene. So we see it down here. Here's uh, Art Deco 00, zero and it's been placed in the scene in the right place. Let's check that. Uh, here's our appearance. Here's our shape. And so, uh, and then here's our geometry that follows. So if we look at this guy, we can say, all right, this goes right where uh, material goes. Okay. So it's replaced the material node and used right there. Notice that to make this work, uh, we also had to add a very special thing called a uh, container field. And container field lets the scene graph know that, oh, that didn't work. Let's try again. Here we go, container field. That lets the scene graph know that the proto instance is a type that's a uh, material node. So it's fitting in where the material slot would be for the shape node. Okay. So let's look a little bit more at this container field business because this is a little tricky and, and this is one of the mismatches between the X3D uh, uh, XML syntax and the classic vermal syntax where in the past with vermal, still with classic vermal, we have a kind of duplicative naming of uh, when you put the scene graph together. And we've been able to make the X3D XML encoding much terser and we don't have to worry about this usually. In fact, we've only even talked about this once or twice in the whole course. But here we have to pay pretty close attention to it in prototypes because uh, uh, the underlying requirements of X3D means that default information, which we've been able to use everywhere else, is, isn't really available anymore. And we have to be able to uh, override the default, uh, the general case default for the specialty nodes where it's appropriate. So let's, let's look at this. Uh, it's a name of a field in the parent, not the name of the node itself. So that's the first important distinction for uh, container field that we have to, uh, it's the field name relative to the node's parent, okay? And so that means uh, the node already has a name for itself. We don't, we don't have to find that, but the node might be used in different roles by its parent. So the container field really defines the uh, parent-child relationship, okay? So, Let's emphasize that. Okay, so uh, now when do we need it and when do we not? Well, the default container field for proto instance is children. And uh, the children field is the most common thing. So all the grouping nodes, sensors, interpolators, even shape, uh, these things all take children as their default container field. And if you recall back, in, in most of the editing panels for all the nodes in X3D, right up at top they have that little sub-panel for container field that we usually ignore. And if, if you look in there, grayed out, you see the default, and it's typically 
children. So this is where you can find out what the container field values are by default for each of the nodes in X3D. But they do differ node by node basis, so we have to keep track of that. So it's finally caught up to us. We've got to pay attention to container fields, what the field name is for a parent to tell it what role does its child have. Okay. At the uh, bottom of this slide, we see the side-by-side -side comparison of uh, how these things look in the two different syntaxes. And so pretty straightforward. Uh, uh, if you ever want to know what the container field is by default in a regular node, you can just look. You can open up its panel. Uh, you can also uh, uh, just type container field in the text window and it'll start filling in what the blank is for you. Uh, but this is uh, where we would need to pay attention so that it knows my proto instance is being used as a material. Because if you think about it, uh, this, is sort of, uh, this is sort of like the, uh, the greatest invention in the history of the world. That infamous joke, you know, how does, how does the thermos bottle know whether to keep things hot or cold? Well, here again, how does the how does the X3D player know whether your proto instance is going to be there as a material or as an image texture or a movie texture or a line properties or a fill property or uh, the list goes on and on. It could be any number of nodes that appear here in inside the appearance. So telling it material as the field name lets us keep track of exactly what its role is. So the side-by-side -side comparison helps you tell uh, just what, what's what. If you look in the book, you'll no also notice that whenever we defined nodes and defined their children nodes in there, in the, in the tables giving the field signature, that side-by-side -side we have the .xml, excuse me, the .x3d XML encoding and the .x3db classic verbal encoding. So that's another good place where you can check and see just how things work. Okay, so that's how we figure out container field. Uh, and you want to make sure it matches or it'll be a pretty obscure error. This is not an easy thing to check against beforehand. Um, um, once we've got that though, we now have to make sure that we have the proper initialization values for it. And, and if you're just using the defaults in your prototype, uh, don't bother. You don't have to give it a field value, uh, but you do have to give it a, a properly typed value, a legal value, if you are going to override the defaults. And so this gives you an example of our material modulator, uh, where if you want to repeat the default, uh, that's okay. Sometimes it's good to put in a enabled true, just so you have a place to put in enabled false and change it. Um, but more likely, you're changing one of the parameters that you want to vary at runtime, like in this one, uh, uh, starting with a diffuse color of, uh, well, let's see, that looks like a dark red right there. Okay? And for simple types, we use the value parameter, uh, which uh, uh, will let us check those and drop it right in place. Okay, so what's next? Uh, sometimes your fields themselves might be other nodes. The node that you've created in your prototype might have children nodes, perhaps several of them. So you can define each one by name by putting it in a field value uh, in the outside and then uh, uh, the node on the inside. So here we go, here's the field value on the outside. And obviously, the initialization node goes on the inside. And of course, these names here are just made up. Whatever your names are for your proto, for your field definitions, they would go right there where it says something new, et cetera. OK. And then another cross check here is that, uh, as you might expect, uh, we can only uh, provide initialization values when the field has an access type of initialize only or input output. 
okay? Because otherwise, it's just a, an input event or an output event. You can route nodes as events, uh, which is pretty cool. But uh, you can't initialize them unless they're designed to take an initial value. So initialize only and input output is how that occurs. All right, so here's a look at our example now. And so we've got a proto declaration for the material modulator. And uh, we can see that it has the fields defined. And uh, this is the first part of it. If we, if we uh, right click on the, the proto declare in X3D edit, it'll give you this handy dandy little interface showing the um, fields all in a row here. Let's us uh, examine them and Oh, excuse me, let's get back here. Let's you examine them and uh, uh, change their values. Um, okay, so standard proto declare, we saw in the first part of this chapter how to do that. Then on the next slide, uh, we see the rest of the proto declaration up here, the script that's inside there, and now uh, proto instance. This is where we uh, first of all, create a copy of the node, stamp it out as a cookie cutter, and uh, this is also where we use the field values to uh, create the override values for the initializations that we want to change. Okay, so once you get through all the business of defining, the overall definition of a proto instance and the uh, creation of its fields is pretty darn simple. That's it right there. It's always proto instance, it's always field value, and that lets you keep track of the name of the prototype and the name of its fields and then the values. So pretty straightforward. So the syntax of this thing, once you understand how it works and what it's about, uh, is quite sensible and frankly pretty terse. Okay. So then if you want to edit on that proto instance, we can see here are the panels that come up. Uh, it does expose container field. Gee, that looks familiar, just like before. It also says, oh, we can def and use the node that's interesting. Uh, it's just like any other node. We can make a copy of it. We can refer to that copy. So that's pretty cool. Um, uh, because it is like another node. We've extended the language, the X in X3D. So uh, we can match the container field. We can def it or use it, one or the other. We can override whichever fields uh, there are and give it a value. So this panel is pretty helpful actually because it lets you see all of the fields that were defined either in your proto declare or your external proto declare. So it simplifies it for you. You don't have to look back and forth, cut and paste, that kind of thing if you don't want. Similarly, uh, the field value panel will offer up for you uh, what fields are available and what the type and what the access type is so you know whether or not a field value is appropriate. So let's take a look at this thing. Uh, we'll go into X3D Edit itself now. And here's our material modulator dot X3D scene. And here's our proto declare that we just looked at. And uh, okay, proto interface, we can see all of those guys. And then proto body, yeah, yeah, there's the definition of the scene. And then finally we get down here to, sure enough, the proto instance appearing where a material would normally appear. It's simply modulating the uh, material on this uh, sphere, on this shape. And so let's look at our little uh, editors for this. If we edit the proto instance element, sure enough we see that uh, we have the chance of overriding the default container field for proto instance. The default is children just because most nodes use children as uh, when they're placed in a scene graph. So uh, eight times out of ten we don't have to fiddle with container field. 
but uh, um, otherwise this is where we would put it. And so this says, I am a material node under the parent appearance. Okay, moving past that, we can select which fields we want to override and just type in the values here. This is also handy because it's showing us uh, what are the uh, default values if it knows them. In this case, it knew them because of um, the proto-declare was in the same scene. Okay. Uh, and all you do is type in or select any one of these guys and um, that's how you get through that. Now let's check the field value and um, let's edit this guy and we can see it has a similar uh, uh, interface, a uh, matching interface to what was in the slide set and it is telling us all of the fields here uh, so that we don't have the chance of uh, trying to initialize an input only or an output only transient field and then we can just simply type in the simple value right there. Um, okay, that's probably everything to see on this guy. Just as a quick review, we did embed the script inside this proto-declare and all it's doing is going through and each time it's tickled by the clock it computes a new color and uh, it adds a little bit to the red it adds a little bit more to the green it adds a little bit more to the blue percent one is the modulus operator so that means round off if you get greater than one modulo one so that means it'll always it'll drop back to zero It'll truncate it, uh, round it off, leave the remainder. So uh, the red's moving slowly, the green's moving a little faster, the blue values are moving the fastest. Uh, there is a trace statement to print it out in the browser console to see what the red, green, and blue values are. And then uh, what happens to it? Well, it gets routed. This new color is defined up here in the script interface. So that guy is an output value and that output value then gets routed from the script to the material node in the prototype. Recall that the first node in the prototype defines what it does. Sure enough, the first node in our proto declaration is a material and so it is serving in that role in the, in the master scene when it gets instantiated and dropped in as a copy. Uh, last but not least is the fields between the prototype interface are connected to there. So I think you can see we've built sort of a complicated uh, set of connections here. How do we define a new node? How do we create its interface? How do we link it inside to the internals of a scene? In the case of a script, how do we modify behavior complexly? How do we send values back out? And then given that cookie cutter prototype definition, we can simply reuse and override the initialization values wherever we want. So uh, yeah, it takes a little work to put it together. But once you see how this all works, you go, oh, I can write new nodes in the X3D spec. I can create and reuse and reuse and reuse and reuse those nodes adaptively anytime I want. That's pretty cool. So did it take some work? Yes. Do you have to figure th some things out? Mm-hmm. Can you extend your language and add to your vocabulary? Yes. Very cool. So, so this is why that extra work is uh, justified. And this is what makes us extensible. Okay, so let's see how we're doing that. Um, that summarizes um, uh, field value and proto instance. And there's our tooltip for field value. 
And our next stop is a more advanced example. Okay. Uh, so our next example is also in chapter 14. This is called View Frustrum. And uh, uh, obvious stupid joke, but true. Why did we create this? We were frustrated. We were frustrated that, gee, putting a viewpoint in a scene and making sure it saw the right thing, it was always a little bit hard and take some time and was kind of error prone, trial and error, that sort of thing. So we thought, hmm, wouldn't it be nice if we could see the outline of a viewpoint? So we tried that a few times in class and then went, oh, this is helpful. Uh, if you have a complex scene or you want to make sure that the viewpoints you're defining are seeing the different uh, actors and, and um, entities in a scene, then uh, here's how we can um, uh, make that visible. So we said, let's draw a, a frustrum. In, us, in other words, a four-sided pyramid that's rectangular and it matches where is the cutting plane for the, the near cutting plane for the user's viewpoint and then the far cutting plane at the visibility distance of uh, how far they can see. So four-sided pyramid truncated at the top and that matches what is available in, uh, in, in the scene, but it's usually invisible because uh, it's not rendered per se in the scene. It's just a viewpoint that you go there and that's what you would look at it. So this lets you go to somewhere else in the scene and go, aha, I can tell what that viewpoint over there is looking at because I can see a visible manifestation of it. Okay, so this is a, a visualization tool primarily for uh, uh, authoring, but it can also be used as part of a scene if you want to say, well, somebody's in my scene, what are they looking at? This would let you visualize, hmm, what's the visibility by different players in the scene? Okay, now to get there, we had to do a little bit of math, and also, I'm sorry, did, did everybody just leave the room? I, I used the math word. Uh, Jeff, you still with me? You're, okay, all right, good. So we can use the word math in this class. If you've lasted this long, you're, you're good to the end. Uh, uh, so here's the math. And the math says uh, we take uh, some of the parameters that are available in whatever the current navigation info is and we compute those. And so if our field of view is the half width of the prototype, excuse me, half width of this triangle, the field of view angle divided by two matches this triangle half width, then we want to compute values of half width, both at the near rectangle on the view frustrum and also the far rectangle on the view frustrum um, um, uh, so that we have, let's mark it up here, uh, we have the uh, two rectangles drawn Here's the near one in yellow. Uh, that's not too visible. Let's try the pen, I guess. Here's the near one. And here's the far one. OK. So um, try it in green, see if that stands out a little more. Okay, so um, if we can compute those distances, then we can create an index line set and an index face set that's partly transparent in order to visualize just what the field of view is. Okay, and so uh, uh, what navigation parameters are there? Well, uh, let me make sure I went to the right place. Okay. Uh, we do have to get field of view uh, is, once that's computed, we can get that, uh, combine those two things. So we, we look here uh, at, uh, well, what the heck are we doing? Okay, this isn't the design per se. 
This shows you the internals, but here are uh, X3D Edit Navigator views, the scene graph. So the one on the left is the uh, uh, proto declaration for our view frustrum. And uh, what this slide is showing is that it's a good practice to, once you have your prototype defined, put it in a separate file and then don't touch it anymore. Instead, reuse it via extern proto declare. Okay, and then you can add your proto instance after that that just uh, implements it. Okay, so that's what this slide is showing you. Use two files. Although, I should also point out that if you're just learning how to do prototypes, get the proto declaration working first with a proto instance. And it's much easier to test right within one scene. And then once you're confident that your prototype is working properly, then go and split it into separate files. OK, there's a, a simpler way of looking what I was just drawing. OK, what else can we say on this guy? Uh, Whenever you do, uh, in this example, the features to look at that uh, we've carefully added are, um, first of all, the combination of how would you use proto-declare or extern proto-declare, proto-interface, and script. Uh, you're usually using three, perhaps four of those all at one time. Okay. The next thing that's good about this example is it shows us how to use the initialize method to uh, uh, first set up your proto at initial runtime before the user starts interacting with it, where it can compute values based on its parameters and make results from that so it immediately loads into the scene. We already know that you need isConnect for uh, internals of a proto declaration to its interface. We know that you want to use a route so that your actual proto instance can send and receive events. Um, you, of course, have to match both type and access type. This is how we avoid runtime errors of trying to stick square pegs into round holes. Uh, we also try to external script code in this so that you can uh, um, get color-coded uh, debugging and some other features. Um, I think it's a good... Okay, thanks. Um, in addition to script node, we have uh, URL addresses, local and remote, of course. These are all good practices. Trace statements that you can turn on or off so that you can uh, debug things carefully, silence that when you give it to users, turn the debugging back on when you're adding a new feature, turn it back off when you get it working. And then finally, uh, var declarations uh, and the use of the JavaScript math library. So this is a pretty hefty example here, definitely advanced work. And if you can track all this and make sense of it all, then you're there, you're, you're at the, uh, the peak of capability where you're extending the language, you're uh, creating new nodes in your palette, and you're building X3D scenes that are quite repeatable and reusable, and, and therefore scalable to making bigger and better things. OK, so let's uh, dissect it a little bit. Again, we're in uh, the view frustrum prototype, the prototype definition in this first slide. And uh, so. What did we define in this scene? Well, we defined, um, uh, say, to know what our viewpoint is, we need to not only know what the current viewpoint node that's active might be, but we also need to know what the corresponding nav info, navigation info node might be. And uh, because data from both of those nodes fields are computed at runtime, to build this set of polygons to visualize the view frustrum. Okay, what else do we offer to an author 
using the view frustum as a proto instance. Well, we can let them define what line color do you want, what frustum color and transparency do you want, and further, uh, what aspect ratio your screen might have, which is kind of cool. Finally, we have a trace, um, trace variable, which lets us turn on and off the uh, Boolean, excuse me, the browser print line statements that will appear in the browser console. Okay, so let's dissect this a little more. What's our line color default? 0 0.9, 0 0.9, 0 0.9. Oh, pretty bright white. And then what's our frustrum color? 0 0.8, 0 0.8, 0 0.8. Well, that's the default gray. Uh, that would stand out as a contrast, but it would also obscure everything. And our view frustrum would not be very helpful if it was just a opaque, uh, a truncated pyramid because then we wouldn't we'd say well we know where it's looking but we don't know what it's looking at because we can't see inside so this is why the, the next parameter transparency is very important so by default we give it 50 percent uh, that's aesthetic it might be uh, user oriented you might want to test that as you go to say for my scene what do I want most because that is a sensitive parameter we expose that by the interface. Now notice that any of these inputs here could have just been hardwired in. In other words, just could be built into the prototype and not exposed for the end user, the end author to modify in their proto instance. That's pretty heavy handed. So you go, why do I have to bother with is and connect? Well, here we go. If you want to have a node that is adaptable, is adjustable to your purposes as an author, then this is why it's so important that you get that uh, concept down. So let's look at this a little more. Okay, so line color, where did that go? Oops, right chair. Okay. And um, how about frustum color? Frustum color goes right here. And then transparency. Goes right here. Okay, so here are our connections within the scene, the primary ones at least. And we can see that uh, our view frustrum starts with a transform. So that means, oh, it's got geometry in it. It's a child node. We could put it almost anywhere in the scene except in a shape node. Good. It's something visible like another object. Uh, what else? Inside it, we could see that we're using an extrusion for, uh, for the... Uh, uh, creating the uh, outline the, of the view frustum. Sorry about that. Let's get back here. An extrusion is for the frustum geometry. Uh, and uh, later on in this scene, we'll also, oh no, here it is right here. We also see there's an uh, index line set. Okay. Now this is kind of interesting right here with the index line set, uh, notice the coordinate index values are already predefined. Oh, we've already created the structure, the outline of this, this uh, uh, truncated pyramid. All we have to do is compute and add the points. Similarly, when we build the uh, extrusion we're going to have to uh, compute and add its points and send it in. Okay, and then just for fun, at the very end, we uh, added a very small sphere to help visualize where is that viewpoint itself? Where's the point in space where that viewpoint starts? Okay, then the rest of this prototype declaration, you can see it ends right, at, right on line 96, is uh, a script node. 
so what's in our script? Well, we have um, captured most of the uh, interfaces defined in the prototype by putting the isConnect links right there. So we go, oh, good. That means these values are coming in and the script can compute stuff with them and then it can send stuff out. So here are our matching fields up at the top. And then in the script, we have some output fields. And those values get routed elsewhere in the prototype. And that's what lets us uh, have a dynamic um, uh, prototype instance that will change at runtime based on its initial values. OK? And you can also, if you drill way down, you can look at some of the names of these here. And you can see that the names I've chosen, we've tried to follow the typical naming nomenclature in, in X3D so that it's sensible. Somebody else can trace it and figure out what's going on. We didn't call these variables uh, A, B, C, D. Similar, similarly, we didn't name the, the nodes uh, E, G, E, F, G, H. We, we instead tried to describe their purpose and, and their, their uh, functionality in ways that would make sense. Because we're extending the language, so why not use uh, the idiom, use, use the way it's typically done. Now, since this first scene that we're examining here is a finished piece of work, it's a prototype. We've got it set aside in this view frustrum prototype scene, and so uh, if the user goes there, he's not going to see a, a, a a view frustum prototype because the scene's not intended for that. It's just intended to be a holder for this prototype. And we want to encourage people to use the extern proto declare elsewhere. So that's why we have our typical approach of uh, putting in some text node that says, hey, what am I? What's in this scene? So somebody who stumbles on this scene by mistake, perhaps looking through the catalog or just opening it up, can go, oh, OK, this isn't the one I want. The one I really want is a different scene, and I should click on this text, and then my anchor node will take me to the scene I really want, which is view frustrum example right there. OK, so that's our logic on this guy, on the prototype definition. Now, here's the script. And you might go, hey, wait a minute, wait a minute. How did I get to a script? Where did I jump for that? Let's go back to our little script node then, and we'll say, OK, uh, script node URL. OK, there it is right there. URL points us to view frustrum node.script, either in the local directory or online. So here it is again, view frustrum script.js. OK, and so uh, what are we doing in here? Well, we're initializing primarily. This is a good example of a script that does all its work at setup time when it's full, first loaded. And then uh, you're pretty much done because the viewpoint is, is fixed in its size and where it's going. And, and uh, that's our primary use for it. So what does it do? First, uh, I think it's always a good idea to get a little verbose about uh, what you're doing. So you'll see a number of print line statements in here. And this is a great debugging tool to uh, uh, let, the, let yourself know when you're testing this thing whether you're getting what you expect or not. Okay, and uh, of course the old Navy slogan here is uh, you get what you inspect, not what you expect. So, uh, so I hope uh, you can take that to heart because print, believe it or not, print lines are still our best way of tracing uh, how these things work. Will we have a full trace capability someday? Uh, boy, I hope so. Uh, live trace, but, but this is a good practice and, and your best shot right now. OK, so we step through then uh, by looking at the viewpoint values and saying, what are they? By uh, looking at the navigation info values and say what they are. And then we use those values to compute the uh, clipping plane distances. And 
let's focus on the computation now. So we're, we're computing the near clip plane and the far clip plane distance and making sure that gee whiz, if the far clip plane is, is too small, then uh, equal to zero, that wouldn't make any sense that we'll set it to 10,000 meters. Uh, once we have the, the clipping planes, we can use our uh, trigonometry triangle picture a few slides back and calculate near half width, far half width, and we go, oh, okay, now we have the dimensions. So spine changed is going to be our output value that is computing the size of the spine in the extrusion. Similarly, the scale changed is the size of how big is the near, how big is the far clipping plane. And then uh, we also have to compute the points. So here we do the math to fill in the coordinate points. Where do those go? Well, they don't go to the extrusion. They go to the index line set that is our frame, our wireframe for where it's at. So that lets the user use either the wireframe or the transparent, uh, semi-transparent uh, geometry index face set, or both, as they wish. It's a visualization tool. so. Modifying is a good idea. Okay, so initialization script, it took a little work to write, but hopefully as you examine this and check it out, you can say, oh, okay, I, saw, I see how each little piece was done. That's how you want to write your scripts. That's how you want to write your prototype so that it's inspectable, it's understandable, it's, it's repeatable, and, and therefore modifiable in the future if you want to change it. Okay, what else goes on in this? So now that we have the proto-declaration done and we have the script that modifies it done, we go, oh, okay, we should take that prototype interface and make an external prototype declaration out of it, and then we're able to do a proto-interface. So here we are. It's put in a separate file, as, as I've described. We put it this time in view frustum example, and here's our external proto-declare, and here's our proto-instance. And you could say, oh, you know what? This was pretty easy. External proto declare simply uh, uh, takes the uh, fields and copies them all. And, and that's all you do. All you have to do is eliminate the uh, initializations, however, because external proto declares don't reduplicate, don't repeat those. Okay? Uh, and then what can we do? Well, now that we have a proto instance, we can override the fields as appropriate. We can override the nav info. We would need to give values for all of that. We can also give the uh, line color, frustrum color, and transparency. So this is how we use it in a simple scene. So let's take a look at this guy now. OK. Uh, view frustrum prototype. Um, If we pull back up the X3D window, we can see, sure enough, uh, down in the lower left-hand corner here that uh, we just get some explanatory text saying, all right, this scene is all about a prototype declaration. Don't use that. Instead, go to the other file, and to get there, simply click on me, and I'm an anchor node, and I'll take you there. Okay. If we dissect the guts of the proto declare a little bit more, then we can see when we edit that guy, our uh, Proto declare tool not only will show us uh, what all the fields that have been defined are, but it'll let us add them here if we want. See, it's just copying them. Or it will let us uh, uh, create a script node, which is a handy time saver. This uh, little feature down at the bottom here. given that you've already defined a prototype with um, fields, um, embed that script and create all the is connects for you. Okay. 
what else? We can look at the individual field declarations. And let's look at these. We haven't done too many field declarations with child nodes. Okay, so it says, all right, my viewpoint node field is of type SF node, single field node, single value, and it's initialized only. So this is a common construct when you use SF node is typically you do S, uh, initialize only because the node exists there and it's not getting input or output, but rather you can route values to it uh, inside the scene. So uh, the value field right here is blocked off as expected because uh, you can't do it for a child of uh, SF nodes. Okay, and uh, instead you would put a node in there. And uh, I put a comment in there, null node, uh, because uh, the tools are a little bit uh, uh, solicitous. They will look after you, take care of you. You will get a warning if there's no initialization node in there, just because it's, it's a reminder not to, not to forget putting it in. But sometimes you don't want a node in there. You say, I, it makes no sense to give a default viewpoint because I want the user to tell me excuse me, I want the author to tell me what viewpoint node he's visualizing. So we'll just put a comment in there and that'll silence the warnings. It's functionally equivalent and that way we know we're uh, keeping track of things. So uh, what else do we got? Well, we've got all this geometry. Here's our script node. We uh, look at this guy and we can see First of all, the URL arrays went from black to green. It found the remote files. That's good. So our script value is there. And uh, uh, what else? We can see our fields that are defined. And we don't have any embedded ECMAScript code because we have the URL arrays external. Um, something that's a fine point you may recall from chapter 9 is uh, direct output. This is checked because some of the fields in there are nodes and they are modified at runtime. So direct output tells the X3D browser to make sure you pay attention to those and if they change you let me know. That I am reaching out and modifying those nodes directly so you have to pay attention. And then finally we have, uh, this is all plain vanilla X3D. What are we hooking up to what? We've hooked up our script to, in this case, uh, sending the orientation changed to wherever this guy is. So this allows us to rotate the view frustum to match the direction of the viewpoint itself. Okay, that's our prototype. Here's our script that we're going down into. And uh, I just dissected this before, so maybe the only thing to note is that, boy, that color coding looks simple, simple but uh, if I type in here as an error, gee, it found it right away. Okay, so uh, what you might want to do is if you have embedded JavaScripts, a good check feature is copy them out to a separate file in X3D Edit, a, a new JavaScript file, and just test the syntax there. It might help you debug and find a problem. If I type uh, a comment symbol first, no error, uh, it didn't flag that. Okay, so it's pretty, pretty darn smart about this stuff and we'll keep working to make it even smarter. Someday, again we hope, live debugging with the scene graph, but that'll take some work. Okay, next thing to look at is our view frustum example. And here was our extern proto declare. And uh, it's just exposing each of those fields without initializations. If it sounds like I'm repeating myself, good. That means you're paying attention, you've learned it, it's making sense. We're just reinforcing all the same things step by step here. Here's how we override our viewpoint node with whatever our test viewpoint is, similarly with a nav info, and then 
we should see it. So let's restart our browser. And see if we can get it to come up here. Actually, let's view it externally and see how well this plays. Okay, so Swirl is not dealing with prototypes yet. What else? Vividity simply crashed. Thanks, boys. We're launching fast and furious here. Here's Octaga. Um, gee, it worked. There's our viewpoint. There's a little green sphere. You can just barely see it. Let me uh, look at it. But the bottom line is it worked. Okay, so high marks to Octaga. Here's uh, instant player, instant reality. Switch to different viewpoints go into out of looks like we get a little bit of a problem with uh, far distance culling on this one but it's in there but you can see at the back of the scene here it's getting cut off prematurely so that's probably worth reporting as a bug here's uh, bit management and we're seeing a similar behavior here which is interesting uh, namely that the view frustrum's there, but it's um, got a uh, calling prematurely. So maybe there is a problem still with the scene. We'll have to recheck that. But that's, uh, it's much nicer now that we are able to test against multiple seams at a time. Uh, I think uh, XJ3D has given up the ghost today. We'll try it one more time. See if it comes up, and then we're on the home stretch. We'll leave that for future work. So what's left? OK, there we go. There's our big example dissected. I hope you found it useful. What we have now is uh, a list here. These are lots and lots and lots of prototype examples, which you're welcome to study and uh, dissect and change and modify and redo and make them your own. So I think you'll find a lot here. Uh, we've certainly uh, find these useful, and they're helping us build uh, more important scenes. Uh, if you click on the links in this, it will take you to the pages where you can find those. You can also download them. So what did we learn? We learned about protos, interfaces, protobodies, isConnect, et cetera, et cetera. We went all the way through to an advanced example. Uh, we have given a few uh, exercises here that are useful. Take something you know that works for you that you want to reuse again and make a prototype out of that. Uh, and then increasing complexity is a good idea with, uh, without scripts. Okay, we've got our regular references. Uh, there are some special scene authoring hints for prototypes. You might want to check those out and uh, some good examples in there. So we're all done. I thank you. If you got this far, I hope you have a lot of fun with X3D. Good luck with your work.